Hello everybody, welcome to Matthew's Interviews. Please like and subscribe for more great content coming from both me and my guest today. He has joined he joined YouTube August 13th of 2020. He has 9,636 estimated account views. He has 51 videos. He has 486 subscribers. His most popular video is Proxima Centauri is not a star with 4.3 thousand views. He has collabed with many narrators and has been a guest on many YouTube podcasts. And he has interviewed the likes of Lady Spucaria and a few others. Please welcome Silver Threads. Hey, everybody. How you doing today, my man? Um, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, you know, I just got uh, sipping my soda here. Good, good, man. I'm glad you're enjoying What are you drinking? What are you drinking? I am drinking the cheapest cola possible <laughs> it just Ooh. says it, it's big a cola over here okay okay now i gotta ask you as our first question what was your driving force to become a youtuber well uh i didn't i don't really have like uh inspirational story it's more like uh i like creating videos uh, i used to create videos uh when i was younger for my friends it would just be our videos of us being silly and or I would create skits and I'd upload it to my YouTube channel uh, a different cha a different channel I really like doing that and after I st I stopped doing that after a while um, then I decided uh, you know I kind of want to start doing that again and I was listening to a lot of horror narrations at the time and I thought hey I could do that um Really, it's just something I enjoy. It's just something I do for fun. Um, and it's been taken off a lot more than I thought it would, really. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think I'd have this many subs within a year. Well, you, apparently you're pretty popular, man. I mean, almost 500 in a year. Very good job, honestly. But why did you choose to focus on narrations? Uh, well, I focused on narrations just because I like telling stories. I, f I find it I find it really fun. Um, I like doing the I like doing the different voices. I like the different characters, and I also like being able to um, I like being able to tell other people's stories in a you know in a verbal in a verbal way because sometimes because a lot of people just type it up and they just kind of leave it online. And for the people who don't read online stories all that much they don't end up getting seen so i like being able to broadcast other people's work as well that's very understandable now i gotta ask what has it been like to collaborate with so many other narrators that has been really fun actually because uh, i've like i didn't expect I didn't expect to do as many collabs as i have done i've done quite a few actually at this point um because uh, once I got into the horror community, I just kind of stumbled upon it, and uh, I ended up talking to a lot more people than I'm used to. I don't, I like before I got into the horror community, I didn't, I didn't really have any online friends just because I don't usually do the social media thing. But once, once I kind of tripped into the horror community, I saw how easy it was to do collaborations, and I kind of wanted, I wanted to meet people, like I wanted to talk to more people, um, and. Uh, collabing with them is one of the best ways to at least get a conversation started with them. And I've made, I've made many YouTube friends or uh, yeah, YouTube friends uh, from doing that. And uh, pretty much every collaboration has been pretty fun for me. I shouldn't say pretty much. They've all been, they've all been fun so far. There, there hasn't been anyone that I've regretted yet. I mean, that's a good thing though. That's a good thing. You know, being yeah. able to like who you collaborate with. Now, oh, yeah, absolutely. Do you have a favorite person to collaborate with, or do you just kind of like working with anybody? Um, in general, I would say I like working with pretty much anybody. Uh, my favorite person to collaborate with so far has been 242. Um, that's just because, uh, well, she she's like my she's my closest online friend. She she's the first person I became friends with online, actually. Um, and me and her have done several collaborations together. We, we've kind of 
both been kind of pulling each other, you know, up into success, like uh, supporting each other. Um, and the reason why our collaborations have been the most fun to me is just because we've done we've done a lot of silly things. We've done like several, like uh, we had two videos in which at the end of the videos, we both did kind of a little bit of a skit where uh, I end up getting tasered by one of her characters. And then I end up popping up on her video and like, um, and it's like, I've been kidnapped I'm, and I'm uh, reading a story from that side. Uh, just cheesy little skits that are just really fun. And um and just recently, I I, I did a, we both did April Fool's videos where uh, I pretended to be her, and I and I read a story on her channel, and then she pretended to meet me, and she read a story on my channel, and I made a really bombastic intro for her character Forty Two, and it was really over the top and silly, and I think it's mostly because just with her, I get to joke around a lot when when I'm doing these videos. Well, 42 is an amazing person. I love talking to 42. She has become one of my closer friends uh, since I started. And, um, yeah. you know, it's, she has done a lot for the community. Like, she's everyone I've talked to recently has had some amazing positive story about uh, 42. She... Um, she is really kind and she is she she wants to help everybody uh so in what it comes down to is if she ever sees something that she can help with like even if it's small she will always focus in on it and she will do her best to be able to help that person and she and that has been reflected with me as well she's she's helped me a lot and i've helped her quite a bit too but her but she her influence is spreading through the community and it's not oh, surprising yeah. to me and I'm, and I'm and i'm glad that people are recognizing that oh yeah she she is just she is just one of the single most helpful people in the horror narration community plain and plain and simple uh everyone who talks yeah, to her loves her because she is just an amazing person through and through now, yeah, absolutely. She even she even hosts streams and stuff. Like, oh yeah. She, anyway, yeah, she's awesome. She is, she's everywhere, because she chooses to be, and because she does it so well, and she just wants to help and love everybody, and it's an amazing thing. It's a gift, and she has one of those gifts, and she just keeps on giving it, and it's an amazing thing to see. Um, but so I've I've watched. You know, I watched your uh, interview with Lady Spicaria, and I didn't tell you this, but I also listened to a couple of your narrations. You're very good at what you do, by the way. Honestly, you really are. Thank you. Um, I can't wait to see more videos from you. But I gotta ask, have you, yourself, ever experienced something paranormal? And if so, uh, if, if you've had multiple, which one was the scariest for you? So um, I'm not I'm not really a believer in uh, paranormal stuff in general. Um, I don't think it's well. I personally just don't believe it's real. Um, but uh, I just love I just love horror stuff because I find it fascinating. Um, that being said, uh, the closest thing to a paranormal experience that I've had um, is very, is very simple. Like, uh, uh, basically I was sitting in a parking lot. Uh, I was like, I was eating McDonald's at the time. The parking lot was completely empty. I was just kind of sitting in my car. And uh, as I was listening to my podcast, um, just suddenly out of nowhere, I heard a man scream in my ear and it sounded like he was inside the car with me and scared the crap out of me. Like, <laughs> and I was, and I looked around, there was no one around the car there was no one nearby and like i said it it didn't sound like it was distant like maybe a neighbor or like maybe someone in their house or something it, it sounded like it was right in my ear um and that 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 definitely scared me uh but since i don't really believe in paranormal stuff i was just like what the hell was that and then it was silent for a bit and i was like huh uh, that was the weirdest hallucination I've ever had. And then I just went back to eating my McDonald's.
Uh, <laughs> just went back to eating my McDonald's after getting screamed out of my ear from nobody. <laughs> um, well, you know, exactly. our mind will actually make up sounds like uh, someone talking to us when no one's there to help regulate uh, hearing and thought processes. I learned this in my psychology class recently. I thought it was quite interesting because it sounds like that's a lot of what happened to you. It, it must have been. <laughs> it was it was the weirdest thing that's ever... Plus, you know, I, I have heard... There have been times where, like, I would think I hear someone talking and, you know, but there's not really anybody around. And uh, it happens to my wife a lot. She... And it, it happens very vividly for my wife. She'll, like, she'll... Sometimes she'll just ask me, you know... If I was talking to her when that when the house is completely silent, and I'd be like, uh, "No." Do you guys? Or she'll with... ask me if. Go ahead. All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, in your house, do you guys have radiators? Um, uh, we we have electric heaters. Yeah. Okay, you have electric heaters. Okay. Um, all right, because like old radiator heaters. Will that little shh sound they give off from a distance can sound like someone talking to you or someone talking in the house even. Um, I know this because, I well, I looked it up. And two, because uh, I lived in a house growing up that had radiator heaters. And, um, you know, when they'd be blowing out that steam from the oil, they it would sound like from a distance someone in the house was just... And you would think, oh man, there's there's someone in the house with me, but no, it's just a radio. Someone talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now yeah. You, you've read a few stories about cryptids, right? I believe so. I believe I watched one about cryptids. I could ask, do you believe in cryptids as well, or is that kind of just one again, like the paranormal? You don't believe. That's kind of the same category. I, okay. I don't like. I don't anything. In fact really anything that's considered paranormal or supernatural anything like that i tend to, i don't i don't believe in anything like that i still i still like them though i i, I find them fascinating mm-hmm. like, i still find them interesting like i i listen to stories about like i'll still like watch documentaries about bigfoot and uh, ghosts and like the ghost hunting shows and um i don't <laughs> well, with the ghost hunting shows in particular, I usually just end up laughing at them because they oh, tend yeah. to be a little silly. But a little I do, silly. I do still love. <laughs> I, I love, but I love ghost stories. I love horror stories, and I like stories about, um, like skinwalkers and uh, Mothman. You know, Loch Ness monster. I, I, I do like that stuff. Um. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who again, like, I believe that paranormal things can happen. I don't believe necessarily that it's absolutely real. Even though I've experienced some really strange things, I don't full-on believe that just everybody always has something paranormal happen. I believe it's probably rarer than it seems. Um, And I believe a lot of the things people experience are explainable, you know? I believe, but I don't disregard it. I believe in the possibility. Does that make more sense? I believe in the possibility that these things are. Oh happening. yeah. Um, oh but, yeah. Like I, I would never make any definitive statement. Like right. this stuff cannot happen. It's more like um, I don't see any reason to believe it happened, mm-hmm. but it, I, I, it could potentially. I suppose I don't know everything in the universe. Right. Like, obviously, <laughs> there, there were humans. There, there could be. <laughs> So there, there could somehow be a way that this stuff can happen that I'm obviously just not aware of. My the one the one cryptid though that I, I really struggle with, is Mothman, because if it was just one or two people seeing Mothman, that's more you know that's very like oh well these two people these two sets of people had this ex- had a similar experience with a creature that's probably explainable but when you have a whole town like point pleasant everybody seeing this same thing that's where it gets a little rough because one or two people you can explain away one or two people you can explain that it was probably something else but when you have an entire town of people that had to live with a disaster that 
around the same time. Before the disaster, I must say, before the ma- before the mass hysteria of the disaster of Point Pleasant, you know, the Silver Point Bridge, you know, it makes me wonder what did they see, because a whole town was seeing this thing. Some more, you know, mu- some much scarier experiences than others. Yes, maybe some were much more close and personal, but. Yeah, most people in Point Pleasant saw Mothman in some way, shape, or form, especially on the day the bridge collapsed. Everyone in that town was saying they were seeing it flying around the bridge. So that does make me wonder, what did they see? Was Mothman a real-life cryptid? Or was it maybe some kind of mass hysteria, you know? Yeah, so when it comes to stuff like that, there's actually a, a set of videos from uh, by Armored Skeptic. Um, I don't like all of his videos, but he he did a set of videos about Mothman actually, where he did one video about oh Mothman, where he did all he showed all the supporting arguments for Mothman, and then he did another one where he said, all uh, where he showed all the evidence against Mothman, and they're both Ooh. good. Uh, I'd recommend them. Um, who um, was it? Armored skeptic. I can I can Armored even skeptic. like link it to you in the Discord. Yeah, please. Um, and um. I don't like I watched it was a while ago that I watched them but mm-hmm. uh, in, so I don't remember all the points he made but in in general when it comes to stuff like that um, paranormal experiences can often be like a community event um, it can be things that pe- because people like telling stories like that um, and when one big event happens that a lot of people witness uh, people's memories can also be altered because it you've probably yeah. you're you said you were in psychology right oh so, yeah i learned all about um, how memories can be manipulated or changed over time yeah exactly so you so you know that basically uh, pretty much every time that you recall a memory it always gets changed a little bit so imagine everyone seeing something weird like this one big weird event they're not even they're not really sure what they saw and then you know one person pipes up and says hey I saw this weird creature. It looked like kind of like a moth uh, and, a, and a man at the same time. And then, you know, another person's like, oh, yeah, it kind of did look like that. And then, you know, the, the story gets passed around and then everyone and then, you know, within a year or two, everyone's convinced they saw a mothman uh, when really what they saw was something. They just saw something weird or unexplainable. Um, so at, it, at the end of the day, like it's it's just. I would just chalk something like that up to their memories changing over time, and Could then be. of course their Could have been very and then of course too. their yeah exactly, and then you know then of course there are all the individual experiences that right. just bolters bolsters their beliefs. Like people will be like, "Oh, I was driving on the highway, and you know this this man with moth wings landed on my car and scared the crap out of me, and he had glowing eyes," and then. I yelled at him and he flew away and you know all those individual stories just leaves and it makes a huge it it basically turns this one weird event into something that into something much bigger and grandiose than it ended up being it it could have even just been like it could have just been like a normal everyday accident that just kind of looked weird from a distance but Mm -hmm. it kind of it ends up becoming something supernatural by the time by the time uh, people outside of the town hear about it i think the weirdest part about the mothman story for me personally even though i kind of stay in the middle of whether it was real or not i stay in the middle because i'm still very undecided because there's so much evidence that support it but there's also a lot of evidence that disproves it but the one piece of evidence that i do find quite strange is that the men in black have paid many visits to Point Pleasant, especially those who are trying to get information out of the locals. They do often show up at those people's door and are like, hey, we know you've been in Point Pleasant. We know you've been asking about this. You need to stop. And that's where it gets kind of strange for me. Of why would the government give a, give, a, give a care in the world about someone looking into something like that if there wasn't something truthful behind it, you know? But, again, yeah, the government has their own reasons for things. There was also the big incident of the point of the Silver Point Bridge collapsing 
next to very nearby an explosives um, where they were keeping explosives and probably some other stuff hidden away there that locals may or may not have known about. So they could just also be like, well, you know, this was happening around a time where we had very experimental weapons hiding there. We need to keep this down so they don't get too close to that truth, you know. So you never know. But it's just I find it weird that the government does get involved when people start snooping around Point Pleasant. Yeah, and it, when it comes to paranormal stuff or even conspiracy theories, uh, I, I just I often think it's weird how people often people often have pretty much everyone thinks that the government is super incompetent. Like you ask pretty much anybody, and they'll be like, "Oh, the government doesn't know what they're doing," but then people who believe conspiracies or all that will will simultaneously also believe that the government is super efficient because they're able to pull off these grandiose plans with the to hide this to hide this specific thing uh, like whatever it is like you know whether it be off man or you know whether or not 911 was real you know those types right. of things like and the and the bigger an incident the harder it is the less like the harder it would be to keep it quiet so i think um, that goes down to like people who people who have seen both sides you know one side of the government all their lives you know the incompetency of our government is more in the political and um population care but when it comes to our military and it comes to our weaponry and it comes to military planning we are very competent we have been able to pull off some of the greatest things the world has seen in terms of military. Um, maybe not now, maybe not so much now, but we still rank up there in a few ways, uh, especially with our experimental weaponry. You know, they're experimenting on things all the time. They are coming out with new types of fighter planes all the time. So if they were completely incompetent, that would not be happening. <laughs> so I think... The people who don't look into what they do more so for the military and just look at the political side of things, yeah, they're incompetent. But if you ask someone who pays more attention to the military side of things and less of the political side of things, or the government really, they're going to say, oh yeah, they're very competent and can pull off some of the greatest things. But if you ask someone like me who has seen both, I can tell you, yeah, in terms of politics, we need to grow a bit more. And we need to stop worrying about big businesses. But when it comes to our military expertise, we rank pretty highly. And that's why no one really wants to invade us or start a war with us because, well, we're crazy. We're Americans. We will do our best not to have to drop another, uh, you know, atomic bomb. But we have it available and ready and are willing if needed, if the needs were to really arise, which I don't see it really happening because every single time uh, North Korea is like oh yeah you know we're going to take over we step in and are like well let us remind you that you're not even supposed to have nuclear weaponry and we do have nuclear weaponry more so than you so do you really want to go this far I mean look what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki you know yeah uh, that 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 is a good point actually and I, I never really thought about it that way i i usually just combine the entire government into one into just one giant body but well, yeah it is one giant body but point. it does two different things and that's what people forget is it yeah. is one giant body but it they do handle multiple different things but the two biggest things are politics and that intertwine with big business and the military you know those form that 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 body of government for the U.S. is is really what it is, but people like to look at one yeah. side, not the whole argument, and that's the unfortunate part. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back on track a little bit here, man. <laughs> I got a little bit of an that's off okay. question for you, kind of to get to get things back into like you know the the questionnaire questionnaire piece. What hidden talents do you have that people may not know about? Oh, well, that's a good, that's a good question. I haven't. I don't think I've ever been asked that one. Um, hidden talents. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure. I don't think I'm particularly. 
I don't think I'm particularly talented in anything. I uh, I do I do a lot of I do a lot of research on things. I I'm very I do do a lot of no I, that's more like secret interests uh, in terms of talents. Um, not not really. I uh, I do a like I do several things on a basic level. <laughs> I'm not an expert in anything. Okay. Okay. Um, have you ever done something like martial arts? Have you ever done something like, you know, written a book? You know, anything that people may not know that you have done or do? Uh, nothing interesting like that. I, I'm, I mean, I, I used to be, in, I used to do sports. I used to be in track and field and soccer. Uh, I, I never, I was never amazing at them, but they, they were fun. Um, I, um, Oh, I platinum Dark Souls on PlayStation Four. So that's there you go. That's, that's that's an my, accomplishment. That's my that's my that's my secret talent. And that well, that is a talent. Not many, you know, a lot of people can't platinum Dark Souls. A lot of people can't even get it's, through Dark Souls, let alone platinum the game. <laughs> that's a talent. Dark though. Souls is it's like I I love I do love from software games. Oh, um, they're so fun. I, they're a challenge, but they're fun. Yeah, I, I tried to platinum all three, but I got st- I started getting burnt out towards the end. I, I platinum the first game. Uh, I got most of the uh, trophies in two and three, but I didn't finish them. I did platinum Bloodborne. Uh, I, I also actually, platinum Sekiro. I was actually about to ask about Bloodborne because that's my favorite from uh, from software game. Is Bloodborne didn't completely understand? Completely understand. That game mine's the original Dark Souls, but. The original Dark Souls was fun, right. but I, I think, personally, I think Bloodborne was kind of the pinnacle of their talent and ability to make a Souls-like game with a great narrative, great gameplay, and, um, you know, just great a, a great world altogether. I don't really remember, like, and any I, loading screens. You know, yeah, like I, and I completely... I, I agree. Like... The, the backstory for Blood, Bloodborne is amazing. It's very dark. It's very gothic. And all the environments are memorable. And the D, the DLC was was great for it. And oh, yeah. it's like everything, like every area you go into, it has a story. And it's always really dark and gringy and, you know, a little bit gross at times. But oh, I, 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 hold I, I love I love. I love I love Bloodborne. Bloodborne. Dark Souls is mostly a nostalgia thing. Yeah, that's understandable. <laughs> I played the original. It was the Demon first Souls. one I played. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I um, I've never completed Dark Demon Souls, but I I need to get back to that one. I remember when it first came out on PS3, and. I loved it at first, and then I realized I was too young for that kind of challenge. I did not have patience required, <laughs> so I was like, "I'm good with this game. <laughs> I'm good." But I did watch someone a bit older than me uh, beat the game, and it always drove me like, "Someday I'm gonna beat one of these games." And Bloodborne was the first I did, and I'm really glad I did. And since then, I've completed them all, and it, it's a fun game. Plus, I like. How- yeah, like uh, plus I like how Bloodborne kind of teaches you how to play the game in a more fun way. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a there's a video by H Bomber guy called Bloodborne is Genius, and here's why. It's like an hour hour long video where he breaks down why Bloodborne is as great as it is. Um, I have and seen it. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a. I've seen it a couple times. Like I just I, I love that video, and I love Bloodborne. Um, yeah, like um, <laughs> by yeah, I, I love I love the series. I, I've and I've played the first Dark Souls many, many times. <laughs> Probably way too many times. <laughs> I think the way that Bloodborne teaches you to backstep and to parry, the way it does, is genius. Because in many of the other games, you know, you can't backstep. You can't. Uh, and parrying you just kind of come across as you play but in bloodborne they make it a point that the only way you're going to survive beating the game is by backstepping and parrying at times um 
yeah, like it it teaches you to be aggressive. Whereas, um, like in uh, it, it was the same thing for me. Like I was, I played Dark Souls, but I was really bad at it, and and it's because I did the shield and sword method, where I would hide behind my shield and you know wait till for them to hit me, and then I'd attack back. But Bloodborne taught you to you know be aggressive, go after people, and by the time you end up beating the game, you know you you you've got it mastered you you are you are aggressive um so and now when i go back and play dark souls i don't even use a shield half the time like and i do a lot better than i used to and it's because i was taught to be more aggressive yeah i think bloodborne was really the was is a game that brings about a skill that can be used in all their other games that will make you better for and with all the other games it's it was that's why it was genius because I think they got tired of people using the sword and shield method. And they were like, all right, we need to take this game and make people understand that the way to play these games isn't by hiding behind your shield and attacking, but by being aggressive and tactical about your aggression. You know, because they put yeah, a shield yeah. in the game, but it was a joke shield. Like, it was literally just a joke. <laughs> and yeah. I thought it was great. And uh, Sekiro uh, even went like a, a step further, and they they made the they made the action a lot more fast paced. Um, so it was so it was kind of like they did a similar thing with Bloodborne, where you know it, they taught you to be aggressive, and then with Sekiro, um, they kind of went a step further, where they made all the en- they made all the enemies a, a lot more fast and aggressive and you had to try in order to be able to get through the game you had to be able to deflect their attacks so it, it had you work on timing and stuff and uh, particularly after platinuming Sekiro that in particular made the rest of the from software games so much easier to me especially after i went back to demon souls like demon souls is actually really easy after you've played something like bloodborne and sekiro I think all the games become a bit easier after playing Bloodborne and Sekiro because, again, they teach you the way to really play the game successfully without a shield. Um, but I gotta yeah. ask, I, I wanna ask something about your stories. What was your favorite story to narrate? My favorite story so far, uh, I think my f- one of my favorite videos um okay i i basically have i i have two answers for this my favorite video to make with my narration was called the cove by beautiful nightmare cuz that was cuz i i did a lot of with the sound effects and all that and it it was fun to read um so there's one side to it uh the my favorite one to actually narrate uh would have been a story that was actually written by my wife. Um, she goes by, she goes by the alias Glass, um, and uh, the video itself uh, is called like Two Scary Horror Stories or something. And it was the it was the second video. It was the second story uh, in a, in her stories about you series, and the reason. It's it was my favorite is because it's told from a second person perspective, where the narrator is telling you something that it's, they're telling the story as if the story happened to you, and the narrator is very you know uh, friendly friendly and uh, a little bit cocky and you know telling you this story this story about this weird thing that happened to you that you just happen to not remember. Um, this one in particular was called a stray hair and it was about like a a hair that was that you find that you find like in your cheek and you put you end up pulling on it and it's really really long it, it's it's body horror it's kind of gross but <laughs> but the narrator themselves was very fun to it was a fun character to be now you have been a guest on many podcasts and live streams what are your thoughts on that Um, it was, I liked, I liked being uh guests on them, but it was, it was definitely very nerve wracking at first. Like, I think the first one I did was, um, for Toon Talks. Um, that was a live stream, um, on Dezombified's channel. 
and it was I was nervous about it at first, but once I got into it, it was it was pretty fun. Um, and um, that's when I started doing my own live streams because I realized live streams weren't as scary as they seemed. Um, uh, in general, I, I like being on other people's channels. I like having the opportunity. I mean, it does benefit me in that it exposes me to another audience, but also it's just it's fun to just have a setting where you can just talk to another creator or someone who's interested in the same things as you and just and just talk about whatever just see like the human side uh, side of the other of the other near uh, youtuber and often the you know it, it's given me a new respect for youtubers or a different perspective maybe um because i used to see like like you know that youtubers are people like you know that in your mind and you know that but it's like you don't it's like there's like this irrational part of you that you know like they just seem grandiose and bigger than life but with the ones that have a lot of subs but now after the other youtubers some of them with you know thousands of subscribers um now whenever i'm watching youtube it doesn't even matter who it is like even even the multi-million subscriber people now just i just i just see them as people with a lot of subs now and that's been somewhat liberating for me if it was feasible for you though would you want to be like a, a full-time youtuber like is that something you want to do if if it was feasible then absolutely i would yeah because um well i don't like going into work most people don't um and I think I would work a lot better if I was my own boss. Uh, and plus, YouTube is really fun for me. So, um, and plus, I'm always coming up with ideas. Uh, I have been on a bit of a hiatus when it comes to uploading videos as of late. Um, but in general, it is something that I, it is definitely something I would love doing full time. Because I'm always having new ideas to, of what to upload. Well, with that said, do you have many plans for future videos that we can look forward to? Oh yeah, like I, <laughs> I have a, I have a huge, <laughs> I have a huge backlog. Uh, things that I actually have stuff recorded for. I have a collaboration with Vexorus and the Scare Lab. I have, like, I, I have their recordings. I just have to do mine. I have another collaboration with uh, Dodge Eighty Two. Uh, Oh, I also have another collaboration. I have recordings from A Clock Strikes Three, um, and oh, and actually, my next video coming out is a collaboration with uh, Miss Creepy Tales. I actually have that all recorded. I just need to edit it and uh, put it out. And I, that's that's everything I have actual stuff recorded for. Uh, I have a lot of stories. <laughs> I have a lot of stories to read. Like, I have a huge list of stuff. Um, now, with so many people being mentioned, who has had the biggest positive impact on your channel since you started? Um... At the at risk of repeating myself again, I think it would be two forty two. Honestly, because she's done because uh, when we first like she was the first horror narrator I actually spoke to uh, back in November, I think is when we met November, October around there. Uh, at the time, she actually had more subscribers than I did. Um, and uh, through our interactions and her helping me and our collaborations together and you know, I kind of, I kind of dragged her into the horror community um, because, just because I was doing more Twitter stuff than she was. She had a Twitter account, but she wasn't really using it. Uh, and then I stumbled upon the horror community and kind of dragged her in. And now, now she's like a centerpiece of it, which is amazing. I love that. Um, and uh, my channel did grow bigger than hers, but I, I suspect that hers will grow bigger than mine in the end. <laughs> I think mine just had a bit of a flash in the pan. But with her, I think she's going to get big and uh, bigger over the long run. And but she but she's always there supporting me and help it and helping me 
that finish videos and she's always reminding me of stuff and um plus she's helped me a lot on the technical side as well because she'll always because she's always like looking around finding new things and how to do them and then she'll pass that information on to me uh another name i'd like to throw out there is as the raven dreams which i know you interviewed him as well uh and he's done he's done a lot for me as, as well he, um a lot of it mostly technical uh he's taught me things about thumbnails and how to make them and all that and plus i've watched a lot of it i've watched a lot of his live streams and you know he, he's definitely been a positive influence as well oh yeah both 42 and raven have done a lot from a lot of people um they really have they're they're like two big pinnacles of the community maybe more so than what people realize and they're both just walking beams of positive energy all the time (laughs) yeah and i know it gets taxing for them but no matter how taxed they feel they always are willing to go out of their way to help people and it's amazing it's an amazing thing to see um yeah, I um actually Raven and I really are pretty close too, since I started a month ago. <laughs> Funny enough, him and I are like becoming really close, and uh, you know, it yeah. just I get to see these people and talk to these guys so much, and I get to, but from an outsider's perspective, seeing how much they have done for the community and are doing for the community is an amazing thing, and I cannot say it or talk about it enough. I will, I would literally talk about it for an hour if I could about all the things these guys do <laughs> for everybody, um, even me, who's not really necessarily like technically a part of the horror community, but I have it, most of my interviews have been in the horror community, and. So they treat me like one of their own for the most part. I think they treat me a little bit different, you know, because I'm not making narrations, but that's okay. But I just think okay, they, they just help everybody regardless, and it's an amazing thing. Yeah, the, the community in general is is pretty accepting. Like, if, if you do anything even slightly horror-related, then, then you're pretty much accepted at that point. Oh, yeah. Oh, I noticed that. Like, after they saw that I interviewed Mortis Media and Let's Read and started with more of them they were like we got to get this guy in here we got to get him in here and help him he needs it he deserves it (laughs) and since then it's just been you know the horror community has been probably the most helpful people in terms of my interviews honestly you guys have made this an amazing thing for me an amazing experience as a total and uh i can't wait to be able to give it back someday um Oh yeah, well, I think really you already are because you're you're, I mean, you're interviewing people, so you're giving people a chance to like express themselves on a more personal level. So it's I th- I think you're I think you're already giving back just by doing these. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I th- I've never really looked at it yeah. that way, but I guess in a way you're right. I think it gives them a voice outside of their narrations and a chance to be who they really are, uh, for everyone who wants to see. Now, I gotta ask yeah, you though about your videos. You made a lot of videos. Fifty one videos in a year. A year. And that's a lot of videos. How long does it take yeah, you I... to make a video? <laughs> Sorry. Well that's okay. Um from from beginning to end, um I would say it takes uh, I guess depending on the video, but roughly in general it takes maybe three to four uh from beginning to from beginning to end and a lot of that is i'd say the most time consuming thing is the recording and then the editing of the audio specifically um because you know i I make a lot of nose mouth noises and snaps and stuff so i have to painstakingly go through it and make sure that those don't show up See, I did a test narration for my channel. Uh, I didn't actually upload it, but I have made it, and it's banked away. But the I have had to do so much editing to it. It's probably been like six hours of editing for a five-minute video because I make so many different <laughs> noises by accident and so many different deep breaths in between words, and it's like, oof. Oh, oof. Bre- breaths breaths are the worst they like are. i i used to, to be breathe? really 
<laughs> really though, like they used they used to be uh, like I've cut down on my uh, video production time so much just just from you know just from doing it so much and figuring out how to cut time on things like uh like for just just one example uh i had a huge problem with breaths like um particularly when there's like a scene where a character is like really angry or getting really upset i would basically say like two or three words and then <gasps> and say another two three words <gasps> uh, <laughs> and uh the way I've cut back on that is relatively simple. Uh, I basically just, I take a deep breath between each sentence and then I record the sentence. <laughs> that sentence, I stop, take a deep breath, read the whole sentence. And if I ever breathe through the sentence at all, I just re-record it. <laughs> like, really? um, and that, has, yeah. And that's, that has cut, <laughs> that has cut down on my editing time so much. <laughs> like because because i hate uh, going painstakingly deleting every single breath is takes so much time and it's it's nuts oh so, so basically it's like nope not doing that anymore and then and that's just one small thing like you you, you learn little tricks to be able to speed things up for yourself over time I'm sure I will. I'm sure anyone who starts a YouTube channel focused around narrations goes through much the same where it's uh um where it's a lot of like learning as you go. Especially those who have to take yeah, breath like, between each word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it, it like it used to take me like if I was editing like a 10 minute video, like even like just the audio, it would it would take me at, at least at least one to one to two hours for like a 10 minute video maybe wow um just just for the audio itself and it uh and then after that i had to i i used to do um the words that are on screen i used to edit edit it in a very inefficient way so it would take between well roughly i don't know it, it could have been anywhere between six to ten hours for a video and it was very exhausting um and uh plus at the time i was trying to do three videos a week back when i first started so that basically all i ever did was youtube and it was very exhausting um i, I don't really do that anymore i usually aim for one video a week minimum and then you know two two videos if i'm doing good that week well, it's good that you're at least trying to get out, you know, one video a week. You know, still trying to keep that content out there. And earlier we talked about, you know, your favorite games, some of your favorite games being from software games. What other games do you enjoy? Um, well, I do, I have been, I like RPGs in general. Uh, I... <laughs> Like I like uh, the Persona series. Uh, the only one I've actually completed is Persona Four, <laughs> but uh, I have played Persona Five and Persona Three. Um, and you know, I also like the simple ones like uh, Pokemon. I like that <laughs> that as well. I still I still play Pokemon. Um, you know, I have no shame in that, <laughs> even if it's a kids game. Um, I you know I I like Nintendo in general I like the platformers like Mario Odyssey and and all those stuff and Mario Kart. Um, I've also been playing when it comes to specific series lately. I've been playing. I dipped my toe into Monster Hunter World like a couple weeks ago, and I have been obsessed with it since. So <laughs> that's. Uh, it could be argued that that's very similar to Dark Souls, and that you know you're you're basically facing a bunch of bosses and they're difficult. Um, I uh, yeah, I'm, I do also like uh, games that are more like uh, uh, Devil May Cry, Bayonetta, those really fast action paced games. Um, I've done a lot of gaming in life, so so I'm just like kind of oh, looking. Man, I understand through, looking through my category. Yeah, <laughs> so like I'm just trying to think of all the stuff that I play. Like I play, I play a little bit of everything, pretty much. I don't. I'm. It's like 
I mean, I'm not a master of any particular game, but <laughs> I've played a lot of them. I am much the same, man. I, I've been gaming since I was three years old. I'm 25 now, so that's 22 years. And, you know, it's just always been one of my favorite things. And I have played so many games in my life that when someone asks me, what's one of your favorite games, I really have trouble giving a straight answer because I like so many different kinds of games. Sometimes I really like going back to the old Mega Man X and Mega Man series. Or in other times, yeah, I like to good. go and play survival games like, you know, Green Hell or The Forest or, you know, Raft or Subnautica. Um, and other times, I like to play RPGs like Skyrim. I have put over 5,000 hours into Skyrim. Um, Holy crap. <laughs> oh, yeah. I put over 5,000 hours a... into Stardew Valley as well. Yeah. Uh, that is actually, no, I, I guess I shouldn't say I play everything. Like, I. Uh, games like um uh my wife loves stardew valley and animal crossing and all those like farmer stuff uh, i don't i don't tend to play that stuff it's just but well, i under i understand the appeal because it's like you know it's it's pretty chill you know you're kind of else you're kind of building up things and it's, and it's one of those things where you can you could basically play them forever uh in my mind i, I think my attention pan, span is just too short I think I I need I need flashy stuff. I need stuff happening. Yeah, I, I I like the action. It has to have a little bit of action as well. You know, like survival games, they're all about survival, but they have moments of action that are nice and spread out. Um, now I got I got a few more questions about your YouTube channel. A couple more. Sure. Do your friends and family know about and support your channel? Oh. Uh yes yeah um in general they're supportive um they're either supportive or uninterested <laughs> uh most of them are supportive uh my uh my brother and my my brother watches some of my videos and my my wife my wife in particular has been pretty supportive um she doesn't watch she doesn't actually watch a lot of my videos um in her she has a specific reason, though, or at least she, she's given me a good excuse that I've accepted. Um, because I told you earlier that uh, she writes horror stories, and she doesn't want to hear. She doesn't read No Sleep, or because she doesn't want to hear other horror stories and then have those ideas influence her writing. So, so uh, I've accepted that. Um, but every now and then she'll watch a video if it's not like a written horror story. That, that's my friends, a pretty good reason. Yeah, it's like it is a good reason, and uh, my friends have they've been really supportive. Particularly my best friend, he's uh, he, he's particularly impressed with it. Um, just the fact that I have almost five hundred subscribers uh, that that like blows his mind, and <laughs> like, and he he's always talking to me about. It. He's just like, holy crap! Like, so many people are listening to your stuff. And, um, and my friends in general, they, they think it's pretty interesting. Um, and, uh, I did say earlier also that I, I used to make, you know, I, I used to make skits and stuff with my friends and I, I had a YouTube channel basically just for me and my friends where I would record our hangouts and I'd kind of, I'd like mix them together and make them really silly or really bombastic. We used to be very obnoxious children. <laughs> Um, so I kind of had a little bit of experience with video editing, uh, before I even started my channel. Um, so, and they're used to me being like this very loud and silly person. So when I tell them that I do a horror narration channel, uh, listen to one of my videos, it usually, it usually surprises them because they're like, I've never heard you be serious for so long. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, well, a lot of people, this is all they hear of me. They only know me as a serious person. Or, it, I don't know about serious, but, you know, they know me mostly as a horror narrator. Now, do you have plans to be a YouTuber for a long time to come? Like, can we look forward to watching your videos for a long period of time? My plan is to keep going... Uh, well, I, I'm just going to keep doing it until I don't feel like doing it anymore. Um, so, and the short the short answer is yes. I, I I do plan on being around for a while because it is something I enjoy doing. And plus, 
YouTube is one of those things that you get out of it what you put in. So if I keep if I keep at the grind for a while, then you know maybe eventually I'll be monetized. I don't ever ex- I don't ever expect I'll be I don't expect to be like really huge. But you know if I could potentially maybe even get between like ten and twenty thousand subscribers and even have like a even a tiny income that that would be amazing to me. Now. My final question for you today, my man. Is there anything you would like to say to your fans, your friends, your family, or your Discord friends before we wrap up? Uh, well, uh, I do want to say, you know, thank you everybody for all your support. I definitely wouldn't have gotten as far as I have without people, without you guys actually supporting me and, you know, pushing me through those times where uh, I didn't you know, those, those difficult times where I didn't really want to make anything or, you know, I was just wallowing, wallowing a bit. (laughs) I I appreciate everyone that watches my content. Uh, You guys are amazing. You, you, it always surprises me how much, how much my stuff actually gets watched. Cause in, in my mind, it still feels like I have 10 subscribers. So whenever someone watches something they made, it always surprises me like, wow, someone actually watched my stuff. Um, and in general, my fans have been very consistent, and I and I appreciate all of the support I've been getting from my friends as well. That's great, man. And you are a wonderful person, and I have really enjoyed being able to talk to you today. Um, I really hope that we can do this again because I need to come hey, up absolutely. with this. I need to come up with a hundred subscribers special now, and. Uh, I may need to call upon you for that if you'd be interested in it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd like, yeah, I'd love to uh, drop in. This has been a lot of fun for me as well. I appreciate it. I'm really glad to hear that, man. All right, well, thank you for being my guest today, and everyone watching. This was Matthew's interviews and Silver Threads. We appreciate you watching this today. Please like and subscribe for more great content coming your way from both of us. Silver Threads. I hope you have a wonderful day, my man. Yeah, you too. Thanks for watching, everybody.